Okay. Warm well, welcome, everyone. Uh, it uh, seems that um, Mikael started the recording, so I wish to well, warm welcome to Lena and all of you for joining this uh, system change sense making meetup tonight. Uh, we're going to have a title called Systems Tools for Anticipation in the Era of Deep Uncertainty. Uncertainty. And our guest and speaker, Lena Ilmola, is a systems scientist emerita from International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. And she has dedicated her recent work to a deeper understanding of systems resilience. Uh, first, she will present us uh, with uh, two case studies of her recent studies and give us a brief summary of the results. And uh, unfortunately, she is not able to stay for discussion tonight, but uh, um, we, we will uh, share our thoughts when she has to leave. Uh, Every one of you who have not uh, met our uh, association before, uh, Systems Change Finland, to cultivate a society that can deal with systemic and complex challenges. And our purpose is to promote the application of approaches that help people, organizations, and society understand and work with systems and complexity. And please become a member if you are not, if you are still considering it's worthwhile. And yes, I started to <laughs> introduce Lena again. Here uh, is a, a short uh, reminder for all of you. And then uh, our schedule tonight is that uh, Lena will present approximately 30 hours, and then we will have some questions and answers and uh, discussion and an event ends uh, latest at uh, half past six. Okay, uh, while you are in the main room, please uh, mute yourself. And, uh, and uh, I guess we are all quite familiar how to, how to handle, handle Zoom uh, meetings nowadays, but here is a reminder for that also. And yes, please uh, do do share your ideas uh, to the chat uh, at the same time while you are listening. So no need to uh, uh, reserve everything for the end of the meeting. And um, uh, here are some things to consider while you are sitting here. But uh, uh, let's uh, talk after Lena's talk. So uh, maybe Le, you will start uh, your presentation from here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, just to check. Are you able to see the presentation? Okay. So um, Pia and uh, Mikael, would you please check that if there are good, uh, important issues to discuss? Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. If there are important issues to discuss in chat, and and please let me know, just in case if I'm I'm not hearing, um, and uh, you are able to hear me, okay? Yes. So my name is Lena Ilmola Shepard, and I'm working uh, with the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. And yes, I have been with the ASA now for 14 or 16 years. And uh, then I'm a scientific coordinator of the Global X network and uh, a network of researchers and practitioners uh, dedicated to their, their development initiatives for uncertainty, to deal with uncertainty. So uh, today um, I will, um, I will try to share with you my recent work. Uh, uh, I'm a method developer by my nature. 
And the reason why I joined to YASA 16 years ago uh, was that I, I felt that the foresight methods that I applied were not covering, were not uh, efficient enough in order to capture uncertainty, increasing uncertainty around us. And, um, and I have been developing systems, uh, qualitative systems analysis now for the uh, last uh, 14, 16 years. And still, as I, when I share uh, 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 what I have, uh, what I'm going to present today, you can see that even after this, all of this effort, me and my colleagues, uh, together with my team, yeah, we are still uh, at our infancy. So plenty of things to develop. And this is the reason why I, I wish that you will uh, interrupt me whenever during my presentation. Unfortunately, I'm not able to join till end of the session today. And uh, so if you have any questions, please let me know so that we can discuss about those issues right away. I hope that I'm able to join to, to the systems uh, change Finland uh, uh, monthly meetings later on as well. So we will be, uh, probably will have an opportunity to discuss after this session tonight as well. So um, I'm uh, first I, I will uh, discuss a little bit about um, the uh, one mainly one case. I cut my presentation short and that's why I'm going to share with you only um, uh, one case, case COVID uh, that we created uh, early 2020. And uh, uh, then, um, then after that, I would uh, like to encourage you to discuss what was interesting, what was impossible to understand. That would be uh, a lot, as uh, according to my experience. And uh, it, uh, what is the most important, and I, uh, I'm, uh, it's a pity that I'm not able to join you, uh, where this type of approach may potentially be applicable in the few, in, in your own context but, but these are the issues and and, uh, and now i'm um, sharing you uh, there's some of this material has been presented in the conference of um, uh, decision making and a deep uncertainty society in last november uh, in uh, mexico city so you will see, I will kind of present you the case and that's why the slides are uh, addressing that case, not so much of this session. So uh, in, in Global X Network, uh, we decided to look at the COVID in February. We uh, initiated the project in February 2020. Um, so very uh, at a very early stage. And you will see later on why, um, how uh, uh, authentic material. So we are still speaking about Corona at that time because it took a while until the pandemics was uh, named to be COVID. And uh, the, our primary idea was to look at the methods that we have applied in several uh, studies and um, uh, to look at that, are we able to define the space of uncertainty with our approach? And then uh, we, uh, our primary objective was to look at the resilience requirements. When decision making, makers are meeting this type of situation where uncertainty is huge, they, um, um, they cannot have any other strategy than, uh, than to uh, present or to introduce a resilient solutions for the future. So that's why resilience. And then uh, we were looking at systems analysis. Um, what is the added value for this type of uh, foresight work? And this was for uh, policy making. I do not re return back to policy making, but um, our our colleagues of our network are advising uh, government of Brazil and regional uh, uh, governance government organization in Brazil, and I have been working with the Prime Minister's office and with the Ministry of Economic Affairs and then Ministry 
of inter, uh, internal affairs here in Finland. So we are uh, using this type of basic study in order to, to share it uh, uh, with the different decision makers so that they can apply if they wish some of the findings. So, um, and this is uh, probably very, you are very familiar with this one, but uh, now uh, all time when I used to work as a corporate strategist, I, I was uh, creating five-year strategic plans. I'm an old person. Nowadays, nobody tries to do anything like that, perhaps in energy industry, but otherwise. But uh, now in the distribution of, uncertainty, um, uh, the, uh, the curve has a fat tails. It means that more and more those uh, drivers that are driving future development are um, uncertain either with probability or are representing a fundamental uncertainty where we are speaking about black swans and extreme events. And by the way, somebody said in, uh, in it was in December, no, in, at the end of March, it was um, a World Health Organization. Uh, uh, the experts said that the probability of the next large pandemics was less than 1%. Uh, uh, so you, you can see that uh, uh, we really need resilience building when risk management uh, that deals with probabilities is not enough, then we have to go to resilience in order to capture those unknown unknowns as we are uh, uh, calling them. Um, we have developed for la uh, during last um, 10 years in YASA method how to deal with this type of extreme uncertainty. And uh, in principle, um, uh, what we do is that we try to define key uncertainties and we have a, a web-based method. It's a kind of Delphi method where we are inviting experts around the world to look at the, what are the most recent developments that are increasing uncertainty and we collect uh, the material. And based on that, uh, oh, we will uh, create a set of scenarios. So for instance, if the one of the uncertainties is the geopolitical world order, like it was in the COVID case. So uh, instead of creating a scenario out of that, we are looking at the, the uh, extreme case where world order is absolutely broken. And we are all the global system, a governance system is in chaos. Or the other uh, end of continuum, uh, we are looking at the system where in facing this type of COVID type of threat, governments are collaborating and they are creating a basis for, uh, for um, uh, a more powerful global uh, government a governance model. So the idea is to stretch uncertainty and then create a scenario descriptions for extreme ends. And when we have um, different uh, dimensions of uncertainty, like uh, uh, geopolitical development, um, um, uh, economic development, or uh, stability of uh, civil society development, we are creating a set of extreme scenarios that should cover some aspect or some area of uncertainty in the future. And then the principal idea, these scenarios have only instrumental value. The principal idea is that we create an, a success strategy for each of these specific extreme uh, scenarios. And in this case, we used um, uh, a typical OECD country as a, as a kind of a mental model. And we created a, a success strategies for each of these uh, extreme scenarios. And then uh, uh, the principal idea is this is robust portfolio modeling method. The principal idea is that we try to identify those actions that are creating added value in uh, at the most of these scenarios, because that type of 
uh, strategies and actions seem to increase resilience instead of only applying uh, one type of strategy that is feasible for the most probable future. Because we know that we cannot anticipate the future and uh, forecast no way. And then we create a, uh, as an outcome, we create a portfolio of actions. Um, and these are very concrete things. Uh, today, I'm not going to speak about uh, so much about portfolio analysis. I'm going to uh, focus on systems systems uh, planning, um, uh, what we claim is that, and what we know already, that uh, we are able to identify a portfolio that uh, seem to be capable of producing success in uncertain environment, if our scenarios and dimensions of uncertainty are, uh, are the right ones. Okay. So in this COVID case, our process was simply that we collected uh, signals of early signs of change, weak signals of change and uh, ideas of key uh, uncertainties, and then uh, oh, plenty of spelling mistakes. And, uh, and then after that, we used the, the, the most important issues as a basis for systems analysis. And then we try to understand that what is typical for the dynamics of, of the uh, operating environment in this situation. And then uh, when we saw that uh, identified the most important um, components and um, we created, we used a morphological matrix uh, method uh, for uh, describing our scenarios. So that is, if you don't know, if you are not familiar with any of the foresight methods, yeah, this is, but the systems is our focus today. So I don't go into detail for those either. So the first thing was, as you see, we are speaking about Corona here instead of COVID or, or some of our colleagues uh, were speaking of COVID already. So first we uh, created, uh, uh, asked that what is going on and what are the early signs of change? And our colleagues were um, um, telling us recent observations, and then we clustered them. And one of the clusters were fear and trust. And uh, then, uh, based on on all of those clustered signals, we created uh, a systems map. And uh, I know that some of you are very familiar with the systems analysis, but uh, just in, in case uh, to tell you um, br briefly, um, the principal idea of this type of systems analysis is to look at that if something happens and it kicks off a development in our environment, uh, uh, what is the how this uh, new incident is percolating throughout the system, and and in order to understand that that what is going to happen, in in foresight our one of our main challenges is that when we are creating a, a scenario we are creating a this mostly in most of the cases we are creating a static kind of story of the future we do not think about how things are evolving. And the reason why I'm developing systems tools for foresight is that it is more important for us to know how things are developing. What is the dynamics? How, how dynamics of, uh, is changing than what happens. And, uh, and, uh, um, why I claim so is that um, we are really bad at, at um, detecting the changes in the dynamics of uh, or the behavior of our systems. We are able to imagine the end state, but how things are evolving, that is very, uh, we are very bad in that. In Foresight, we don't even try to do it. A backcasting and some methods are, are different. And uh, the, uh, so we try to understand interdependencies between uh, different components. 
and then how the uh, we try to understand in foresight because unfortunately we have to deal with all of the systems not only economy or civil society we have to understand how all of this is coping together so how these different systems are dependent on each other and um, and that is the idea and this is the outcome based on all of these components are based on the on the comments that we collected uh, from our network. And um, green arrow is a positive impact. So A is, when A is increasing, also the B is increasing. So uh, when the volume of global supply chains is uh, growing, it means also that power of China is growing. Red arrow means that uh, that um, um, when uh, what is then when populism is increasing, uh, 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 it means that domination of Western democratic values is decreasing. So it's uh, inverted. And then there are some interdependencies that we know there must be something, but we do not know what it is, what is the nature, and those were we are depicting with the blue arrows. Uh, so how we use in qualitative systems analysis this type of systems map? So uh, first thing is that we try to understand what which one of these components plays a, a larger role in systems behavior, what is important and what is not so important. And uh, in, in importance, we are measuring about centrality of the component. As you see, budgetary stability of governments, uh, uh, plenty of arrows are uh, coming uh, to the box. So it has a high in degree. And then it has uh, also uh, uh, some arrows out of the uh, budgetary stability of governments. So it has also uh, some out decree. So whatsoever happens in this system, it seems to be a typical that uh, budgetary stability of governments will be changed, that uh, that component is reacting on what is going on. And this uh, component is also impacted on other components like here, power of the European Union. So uh, um, that um, will, um, uh, will be um, impacted as well. And so the higher is the in and out uh, degree of the component, more important it is. Of course, cor corona or COVID pandemics um, that time I didn't even know how to write pandemics. I, I wrote pandemia. So this is authentic material with all the mistakes. Um, so at that time, COVID pandemics was of, of course the triggering event and that uh, percolated throughout the system. But then we can see that budgetary stability, for instance, and financial stability seem to play a higher role. So we should take um, those components or those drivers of the uh, global development into a special account when we are creating scenarios. Okay, now questions. No questions? Okay, I will go on. No questions in the chat at the moment. Some comments. Just go on, thanks. <laughs> Okay, um, um, now I have, oh, Joe has a, a question. Joe, please. Just, yes, just very quick question about this. So the, um, you're aggregating all the in, in inputs and, uh, and outputs to come to these numbers, um, or are you differentiating between negative and, and positive flows? No, um, not at this uh, stage where all the, all the uh, links are counted equally. Positive okay, so it's just an indication of activity rather than yeah, indication uh, of centrality of the net. component. Yes, that's okay. right. Thanks. Then, um, if as you see here, stability yeah. of society. So, yes, is sorry, there... Lena. Yeah. Yes. 
please. Yeah, question here. So I, I recognize, of course, the, the system dynamics uh, modeling or, or at least the visual aspect of what you're showing here. So my question is, if you mentioned that the dynamic evolution or simulation is important, uh, what, what do you do with the blue lines where you don't know the impact? How do you do, you do simulations and you, well, how do that you treat That is a those? nasty question. That is a nasty question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We create a, no, no, that's okay. We create a hypothesis. So we, uh, we define, uh, uh, we create an, uh, we, presume that uh, the nature of a link is something, but then when we are analyzing the outcome, we have to return back to the uncertainty of the nature of that link later on. All right, thanks. Yeah. And this is typical. Um, the, um, in plenty of cases, people are in systems analysis, like uh, Peter Checkland told me, that unfortunately, after his uh, uh, work of soft systems analysis, uh, soft systems method, nobody uh, paid any attention. And he told me that no one is developing uh, qualitative systems analysis. This was about 10 years ago when I had an opportunity to meet him. And people are going to quantitative uh, systems analysis. Of course, it's much easier. It is irritating that we don't know and we cannot measure. But it doesn't mean that the system's dynamics is not true in our society. And we should understand it. And if uh, the fact that uh, out of um, uh, 80 uh, arrows or links, we don't know the nature of uh, five of them, it shouldn't prevent us of uh, conducting a, a rigorous analysis. OK, now somebody else had a, a hand raised. Alisa. No, Alisa is going to join us. Okay, I'm going to. Yeah, I think it was Sebast Sebastian has his hand up. Uh, oh, yes, Sebastian, please. Lena, hello. Thank you for your presentation. Um, just a very quick question. Remind me of the question that you are holding at the outset, creating this map. Yeah, what is the impact of uh, uh, COVID pandemics? On, on a national society, on, on, on national level? Okay. In one country. Okay. And the Corona pandemia, how did you define that as a variable? As it sits so centrally, however... Yeah, it's, um, it, 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 at that time in the media, especially in the Finnish media, I'm from Finland, they were speaking about Corona because it was a Corona, uh, the COVID uh, uh, virus was a member of a Corona virus family or however you say it in English. So that was the pandemics, COVID pandemics. And that was the, the triggering event that we were uh, analyzing. And that's why it has a central role in this map. OK. And if I, I go now a little bit further, so uh, here you can see that stability of society is one of the uh, one of the output components. So whatsoever is happening in the in this system, uh, stability of society will be a sensor. It will uh, stability of society will change. And uh, and then uh, we studied uh, this um, system separately. And uh, we uh, were looking at the radicalization and unemployment caused by uh, long COVID pandemics. And, um, and here we were able to identify the key components of this one of, uh, of uh, a social stability. Um, yeah, I don't go uh, so much. Uh, uh, but if we, if uh, as we noticed that one of the threats of our society during this type of massive pandemics is stability of our society and potential radicalization, then of course it is important to understand that what are the components that create uh, uh, this type of development and what is the what is the what are the feedbacks that are, are look um, defining how this system is operating 
Now, one comment about a qualitative systems analysis. Now, we are using this as a tool for foresight. So these maps are a shared, represent a shared mental model of our 20 experts around the world. So it doesn't mean that this is a representation of reality. It is only our best understanding, shared understanding, how things may evolve. Um, why we are doing this is that uh, uh, we want to understand uh, if the system looks like this, what is the behavior pattern? And for that, we are able to analyze uh, feedback loops. And I don't go into details um, into the um, into the kind of the theory or the mechanism behind it. But what is really interesting is that in in qualitative research and especially in um, in foresight, we do not know that what, what, is the, what is the type of the dynamics. Uh, if we would know that, okay, this type of system is exponentially, ex exponentially growing or declining, it would inform us awfully lot. If we would understand that typical for the system is oscillation, uh, then, of course, the government uh, or policy recommendations uh, are totally different than if the system is goal-seeking. So this is the, the basic reason why I am doing qualitative systems analysis. I want to understand the behavior better. And even if we do not have quantitative um, uh, tools, we cannot use quantitative tools, if we understand the nature of feedback loops, then we can uh, create a, a hypothesis about the behavior pattern. And that is, of course, something that is much more than in any other foresight or any other qualitative research we are able to do. This is not easy, and it takes awfully a lot of work. I'm building now a, a systems um, national system, a description of a Finnish well-being system. And you can only imagine how difficult it is to do. But the idea is that simply that um, it is one of the tools that may help policymakers when they are defining the right policies. OK. Um, Linda? Linda? Yes? Sorry, one question. I mean, uh also come from a public policy background. Uh, is it are these models being used, or have been they been used in the past, or or this is a, a, a kind of a recent proposal that it's beginning to be acknowledged? In Yasa, we have in Yasa we have uh, developed uh, in our advanced systems analysis program. We have developed uh, simulation tools for qualitative systems analysis, so we are able to simulate the behavior of the system. Yeah, but my question was if, if it, the public policy makers are, are considering oh, yes. this already, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, not so much, unfortunately, uh, or luckily, uh, whosoever. In Finland, uh, policy makers are really in, interested in, uh, in systems approach. So we have been able to advise uh, Ministry of Interior uh, during the uh, refugee crisis in 2014, 2015. And uh, we were able to uh, build a simulation model when the process, uh, when the crisis was uh, just uh, had started. So we were able to provide some advice. It's a different thing if they obeyed it, because uh, yeah. this is only one of the tools. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. But and now for the well-being system, national well-being system that we are producing with the National uh, Research Institute of uh, Health and Welfare here in Finland, uh, THL, uh, now we are going to build this summer uh, a simulation tool that can be uh, used for policy planning. And that will be qualitative. 
but, but that is a different story. Whosoever is interested in that, I'm more than happy to tell about it later on. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and and then uh, we are Excuse using venting. Uh, yes, there is Arnaldo has a hand also. Yes, please. Uh, Lena, thank you so much. Um, my question, I think, is related to your emphasis on qualitative analysis of systems and yeah. the discord or the discussion that you have then with policymakers or can be ha have had with policymakers. So, uh, have you been in a situation where policymakers struggle to understand the qualitative type of analysis and ask you yeah. to revert yeah, to a do. quantitative one because maybe numbers are easy to grasp uh, or some the or let's say quantitative analysis easy to grasp and how did you respond to that yeah that is exactly the uh, the situation uh, mostly uh, in when we operationalize qualitative system into quantitative model we have to use numbers and then unfortunately the uh, policymakers can see some numbers in the final report and it is really, a, and this is something we try to develop so that, how do you say, we have simply a traffic lights, a green, um, yellow and red or, or something that is so qualitative that they do not try to compare the giraffes and apples. Yeah, it is a it is a problem. Uh, would love to develop a solution for that with with your guys. Okay, um, I don't know if you are using Vensim. We are using Vensim. It's the best of the systems tools that uh, fit for qualitative research, even if the uh, reporting is. In, Exactly impossible. So what we do now is that we simply take out of the a loop um, a report from um, for each of the components, and then uh, those components that high, have high degree. So those are important components. So we are studying more closely those uh, feedbacks. As you know, it is, the challenge is that the stability of society in this case had a thousand and a hundred and sixty five loops and so on. So you, there is no way that you can analyze all of the loops. But we try to analyze those loops that include key components because we know already that key components play a big role. And then uh, we are looking at the, the nature of loops. Um, if they are, uh, uh -huh. if they are reinforcing, or if they are balancing, and um, uh, I presume you know uh, about this, but <clears throat> I can tell you later on, or share with you some material if somebody is interested in in this field. <coughs> Uh, in this case, uh, in this system uh, map, the, um, we analyzed the, the loops and it seemed to be that um, dynamics is reinforcing. And that means that whatever is happening, it is the behavior of the system is escalating. And uh, we, our conclusion was that the COVID pandemics uh, uh, will trigger a long-term negative development. And the, it is very difficult to, to change this development um, because the reinforcing nature of the key feedback loops was so, so strong. Um, Oh yes, the, here we were analyzing more closely the blue uh, links that I, I told uh, uh, we had this one. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is something that you get out of uh, uh, Venzim as well. So uh, systems maps uh, are really, they are too complex for any of us to capture. And that's why we are using uh, um, cores and uh, uses trees as, um, as a, a kind of a visualization of the system map. 
And this is something that is easier for policymakers to understand. And you can check that if, uh, if these connections, if they make sense or they don't make sense. Okay. Oh, yes. And then we had, a, we were kind of expecting that, um, that uh, low probability or non-likely, but the high impact scenario could have been a, a major a disruption in, in the country, uh, neighboring country for Finland. So we studied also what would happen if uh, Russian society is collapsing due to the pandemics. Okay, now, uh, when we conducted a systems analysis, we were able to identify the central uh, components, central variables that play a role in the world uh, after uh, COVID uh, uh, crisis pandemics. And then we were able to identify uh, key uncertainties, those blue arrows that we didn't understand at all. Um, those represent key uncertainties. And based on that, we created, uh, we used morphological matrix and we created uh, three scenarios. And this makes our, all of us laugh. We thought that what about if the pandemic takes uh, three months or six months or even 18 months? Even our group that is focusing on extreme uncertainty, they couldn't imagine that it will take years to recover from COVID. Uh, okay. And then uh, this is morphological matrix. So uh, we had a, a different uh, um, dimensions, uh, change of the societal values, populism, politics, role of China, availability of funding for governments, global governance, financial system, stability of society and migration. And then each of these uh, dimensions have alternative uh, states that have been uh, described here in this uh, matrix. And simply the morphological analysis is that you simply combine uh, the, these different uh, states and create a story. And then you create a, a kind of a policy recommendation or you can analyze them create success strategy for each of these scenarios. So this is how we use the material we collected from um, systems analysis. And uh, uh, this is an authentic slide of the presentation made in uh, March, mid-March uh, 2020. And um, our recommendation for the government, Finnish government, at that time in that meeting was that if the likelihood of the total economic collapse is big or large, perhaps would be better to say, then the trust in government should be maintained at any cost. And that was exactly what happened, not because of our work, but because I think that policymakers and the, the government, Finnish government at that time, um, they decided to support uh, economic system and healthcare system with uh, any cost, with the cost of, of course, sovereign debt is in has increased prominently, but that has happened in other countries as well. Then uh, the final slide is simply that uh, uh, these were the uh, were our conclusions, and I just to share with you that what were the conclusions kind of close to the reality, and what didn't happen at all. So what we didn't see was the uh, stronger uh, or dominating role of China, that didn't happen, and military conflicts. Uh, are um, historically they are um, outcome one of the outcome comes of pandemics, but we cannot say that the Ukrainian war is because of uh, COVID pandemics. So I don't believe that that is true. And uh, we uh, we wondered that the structures that should be applied, new structures, uh, would uh, deal with the uh, funding for governments, the public sector 
but we uh, i think governments all around they were able to fund their covid helicopter money and other subsidies easily with the um, yeah, traditional means and we didn't we saw the leap for uh, digitalization but we didn't see any leap for automatization uh, uh, production so that was not true okay this was the um, uh, this was the the case and um, uh, I don't know if I made a right choice because I showed you the uh, slides from the presentation that was prepared in March 2020 without any, um, we didn't apply any after uh, any kind of, we didn't edit the material because our conclusions were wrong just to um, show the, them as they are authentically and uh, just to reveal it also where we did fail. All right. Thanks a lot, Lena. Uh, I appreciate the authenticity myself at least. Uh, it, it gives uh, trust <laughs> to research. Transparency is, is something nowadays that you really need to rely on with all the fake stuff in the world. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't uh, uh, I noticed uh, Daniel Kangogo's uh, question earlier, but I think it was worthwhile for um, him and us to wait for the answer for that. So Daniel, are you there? Would you like to uh, ask it from Lena yourself? Or shall I read it here? Okay, I don't hear anything from Daniel. So, so uh, he, yeah, he, he has written that, uh, how do you create the causal loop diagram? Is it a participatory approach or surveys was conducted? And uh, maybe I missed this bit, he says. Yeah, very good question. Uh, so the map itself is created in a participatory process. So, and, and then uh, when we analyze or de uh, detect causal loops, that is uh, absolute, it's only technical exercise. And Vensim program is producing us the, uh, the report with the list of the uh, loops. And then we are using some other tools. I uh, do not know if you are familiar with Parmenidas Eidos um, systems uh, tools because that is able to calculate uh, uh, even qualitative feedback loops uh, and uh, uh, to detect uh, what are the most important loops. But it's a different program and it is uh, pretty uh, um, cost, costly to buy. So, so um, but uh, uh, when you have created a systems map, then it is only technical issue that what are the feedbacks the tools are providing you with a list of feedbacks oh. yeah yeah that is a parmenides edus yes okay great lena is seeing chat now also and sebastian had a question or or is it still valid <laughs> Actually, it, it works wonders. Uh, Joe was so kind to uh, put the link. To the <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Great. And I, I, I missed. I don't know this venting. How, how is Benzing. it there? Benzing. Yeah, how, how is it spelled? So I am not sure um, if I'll, I have missed. Well, so I will put it to the chat. Yes, please. Thank you. And uh, is there anybody who has been part of this kind of participatory approach in systems analysis? That Lena was describing or other, other kind that you could compare with Lena so that we could hear some, some insights. Well, uh, uh, I was, uh, well, hi, I'm Jaime Alvarez. I'm here in Finland now, but I was part of the Chilean government for the National Council of Innovation. I was the leader for a national commission for natural disasters, a high level presidential commission where we, we had uh, politicians, uh, experts in academia, 
people from the civil society. It was a very, uh, it was a very uh, in, in, an awesome conversation. And uh, what I missed because I wanted to do that, but uh, but it was hard a hard sell to have these level of analysis. The conversation was ideal, and the group was ripe for this. Um, now that I'm here in Finland and I'm, I'm, I'm listening to, to your presentation, Lena, then I think that we should connect with the Chilean government or others in order to, to use these as a powerful tool. Um, so having said that, the results of the conversations were very systemic of, other than not using these tools. And the impacts were really, really important. Uh, I'm not gonna use more time, but, but, uh, but it, it, is, it yeah. is necessary to, to do these conversations with this level of understanding and the tools are of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. And the challenge is of course that uh, if you, uh, as we know, even, even if somebody presents me a systems map, uh, I, I do not have any comments because uh, if I do not understand it at all. So this uh, participatory process is a prerequisite, but how to get key decision makers to participate, that is a different thing. So, so this is something, um, and uh, this is something we <coughs> try to develop in YASA. So that um, uh, easy ways, because if you first have to uh, educate the par participants with a, a five-day systems course, you never will have anybody to participate. You have to simplify the process so that people can yeah. people can uh, get an access in an easy way. So uh, mostly what we are doing now is that we are creating a kind of proxy for the system. And then we ask people to uh, list all of the things that are important for that specific system. And then we check, tick, which one of these important issues are represented in our predefined map, for instance. But there are some other tactics because I believe in participatory process as well. So uh, definitely we have to meet. Perhaps we will have an opportunity to look at the policy, gui policy guiding or policy analysis uh, later on uh, in one of the monthly sessions. Yes, Thank you. Uh, Fabian, you have your hand up. Yes, I, I just wanted to share that we uh, did like uh, six years ago an uh, exercise uh, coming from the participatory leadership field that uh, at that of hosting umbrella that is called work cafe that probably most of you would know so we did that without uh, mentioning uh, any, uh, anything about systemic thinking or system thinking no word not wording at all and then we had a graphic recorder uh, who she was wandering around and uh, capturing knowledge and synth synthesizing that knowledge visually without any arrow, without any causality, without the systemic language. After that harvesting finished, then we were a small team of translators. So we translated all those insights that came from harvesting into a collective systems map, uh, yeah, of uh, course, very... called qualitative, right? Yeah, that right. is very that is very interesting. That is really interesting. Uh, that is something that uh, I, I would love to. If you have any material about it, I would love to see what is the material and how well, how, how how you made it. Uh, the so, material is uh, here, but uh, but I can <laughs> uh, uh, I can do a narrative and uh, share with you. When yeah, I like. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because and I, I think that, myself uh, organized one uh, that was around the, the safety or security in, in society, but not only physical security or safety, but health, food, education, etc., are different dimensions. So that was another interesting uh, uh, knowledge co creation uh, dynamics, also with the same several tables with the same dynamic of uh, interaction, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it tends to be very it's... useful doing that. And then uh, one complies with the first law of system thinking that is never mentioned system thinking. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I I think I've, I've bit, I ought to re program my brain without yeah 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 you you are exactly right. Where next time I will try that. Let us see what happens. It's hard when you are coming from International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, not to mention, and my program is Advanced Systems Analysis program. So <laughs> yes, I I have be. been directing a system dynamic center for 10, 10 years, but I learned the loss of, of interacting with people who don't know anything about. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what would be really interesting to know why some people, for some people, systems uh, approach or syst kind of this type of thinking is absolutely natural. And, for, for, and why for some intelligent people, it's impossible for them to understand. Well, we had people a, are polarized in this respect. We had a discussion with Alexander Laszlo uh, here in, in Buenos yeah. Aires. Yeah. And he uh, talked to us about the difference between systemic thinkers and system thinkers. So systemic thinkers do not have any formal education, but they do. They think systemically. And system thinkers, they have all the formal stuff. But both of them are excellent. Right, so you don't need to be a specialist to uh, think no, systemically. No, no. You can be no, 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 part no, no. of an Aboriginal population that they have a, a very old uh, type of uh, thinking that is system thinking. So, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. and they of course didn't have any formal training on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is great. Uh, uh, dear friends, I'm sorry, I have to go back to my husband uh, right now. Uh, it was great to meet you. And for sure, I will join to the, uh, to the uh, network now. And, and uh, I would love to hear more, more details about how you have done this. Because this is a challenge that uh, I think that it's our responsibility to help policymakers and help uh, also corporate decision makers to do uh, the right decisions. And they have to understand better systems, uh, nature of the world. And uh, if we don't, if we can't help them assist them, so who can? So it's our responsibility. Thank you so much. Thank you, okay. Lena. And, and everybody who joined. Yeah. Yes, and, and Thank please. You very much, uh, Please discuss and, and tell, uh, uh, share with me later on that uh, where we could apply this kind of approach if they, you have some new ideas. More than happy to hear about it. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Hi, Fabian, I think that link you put in the chat about uh, CLD and, you know, the assumptions that lead to surprising uh, behavior from uh, this uh, 1986 paper, I think that, that is really interesting. And like, like we heard from uh, Lena, I think, uh, I think uh, when you're building these type of models that um, represent your, um, it doesn't represent, it's not the, it's not the territory, but it's, it's a map of how you, you, you understand the world and it's always always reductionist, which means that you never catch all the uh, relevant variables. So I think I think uh, that's a really interesting quite uh, interesting discussion to have around that topic. That uh, how re how reliable do we think that these maps are, especially in like these type of uh, societal open systems where you can't capture all the information? Yes, I, and I also uh, post like a question there: How do we deal with environments where? Variables and relationships bubble and emerge and disappear continuously. So why should we map anything, right? Uh, and not develop other capacities, right? Uh, so that that might be the challenge for system thinking, right? So how to make sense of of lava-like environments that are constantly moving in real time, right? And uh, that's a big reason why we have, we call this uh, meetup meetup uh, series sense making meetup because especially yeah. that sense making and so understanding what is happening and how how things are changing and then 
also being able to uh, make decisions based on that. I think those are maybe the key key qualities. But I think we are also touching upon the question of the di difference between complex systems and uh, and the systems hard hard systems, especially. Um, I think uh, how we approach those two are very very different. This has been really fascinating for me. I'm kind of very much an, it's also kind of intimidating to be in the Zoom with so many people who are professionals and, and research, academic researchers in this area where I'm a bit of a, a dilettante and but fascinated by and, and learning a lot about this at the moment. I've just recently been um, completed um, a boot camp with uh, uh, an organization called Boundaryless um, who are on, on platform design and um, it's been quite interesting there's of course like uh, a lot of uh, thought gone into network effects and and feedback loops and how that can be leveraged effectively to help a, um, to help a, 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 an ecosystem or a platform or marketplace grow and of course everybody's looking for that exponential growth curve but i think it's interesting how you can very easily end up with creating a system that can have a a very undesirable curve like um uh, there was a, a good slide in the presentation there showing how some of systems can surge and then uh, collapse so um thanks for for all the the um uh links and and thoughts that have been shared here um excited to find this community and to, to learn a lot more from everybody here Well, thanks everyone. I, uh, I, my, me. I think Pia, Pia, <laughs> this your, is so much better. Your, Pia, your, your, your uh, internet cut. So you, you, we just heard your first word. So you have to repeat everything. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. For To mention that I inter, uh, introduced myself as academic, but I, I am more to as a generalist here in in systems change. I, I have some knowledge about foresight methods and uh, and and uh, do that also about uh, systems analysis and and I have background in knowledge management. So 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 it's it's really really in enriching always to get these people, you people around to learn more. And 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 make the patch more tight, <laughs> uh, the patchwork more tight. So no need to apologize for being a practitioner. <laughs> On the contrary, <laughs> it's it's so much to learn from all of you and us. Yeah. Kari, Mikkel, you always have something to say. What are your thoughts? <laughs> I came late because we did do a systemic proposal for EIT kick for the European Commission, so I didn't follow from the start. It was nice to see Lena Ilmola again. I worked 20 years ago with him, looking the e-learning global markets growing together with their tools on that time. Uh, perhaps I think that that notion there that that these system uh, pictures they are more mental models of those people who who do them they are not a real picture of the real world and that's the problem I have faced all my life when you do these type of things and then you try to explain that to others who are not being involved in the process they don't understand and now i understand they don't understand it because it's my view of the world it's not the you know shareable and perhaps that's the discussion what we forks by put the link from the climate university thing in Aalto university and in finland and how to how to articulate then if we have some kind of understanding of the systems 
and their behavior and impact, how we articulate that to the politics and those people who do decisions. Because as Lena said in some ways, that nobody understand this, you know, our, our pictures. Perhaps the narrative type of thing, what she, she said, it was nice. But I think that's still the thing, how to give the systemic view for those who make the decisions for us and how to how to help them to do good decisions. Yeah, that's that's a big big reason why uh, maybe for like um um are fo focusing on more on the decision making points and you know uh looking at what type of you know uh, tools and what type of you know uh, visualizations what type of perspectives might be relevant for uh, decision making and when you have this situation where you have to be you know, you know uh, able to make some kind of systemic decisions i think that's a very good constraint for making any type of uh, systems models and, and that's um, one thing what i've learned in my own work i do system change type of projects but is that that the orchestration of the change it's not the process it's more a practice of doing different kind of things so you can't automize it and that's perhaps sometimes difficult for the public administrator to understand that you can't do, do a structure which it's by itself does the thing there have to be people who do it and it's allowed that they do their own decision inside the thing and some way they should collaborate to do decisions with all together it emerges the higher level of good you know orchestration but that's difficult sometimes it's not believed that that's possible but i somewhere believe that it should be also a competence of the capability of the teams to do it uh I, I, I saw I, I was participating. I oh, sorry, Fabian, you had a hand. <laughs> Please, you you first. Yes, I just uh, I just wanted to share that uh, there is a let's call it tool uh, that is uh, very close to climate interactive. That is a spin off of MIT. Uh, that when you develop some policies uh, and you anticipate impact. Uh, and uh, it should uh, impact several dimensions at the same time. Uh, so th there is a nice flower that is called uh, like uh, the, the multi-solving flower, something like that. So the technique is called multi-solving. And therefore, when, when you design solutions uh, uh, and you try to filter them, then you, you can pick the ones that uh, have the, the largest impact on the most quantity of dimensions, right? So, so it's a, a very useful tool for that. Just wanted to share that. Yes, thanks a lot. And 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 I I also um, uh, believe in visual uh, techniques a lot. So so um, I went on a course uh, last summer in Alta University, and there was this. Um, a researcher who made uh, documentary films. So when, when, because uh, I'm I'm quite uh, enthusiastic with uh, process research that and and process ontology that sees the world in constant motion and and and, and stability is the the uh, something that is not norm and and uh, and uh, when you look at things from that perspective, this this um, videographer or how to say this documentarist, uh, uh, he, he so showed a really, really, really uh, emotional film about a fishing, uh, overfishing. And it really made the, the complexity of our, our uh, behavior and, uh, and, and, and what happens to animals even, uh, it, it made it so concrete when we, when we saw how, how badly they were treated, even though it was just kind of, normal fisherman work but it was slaughtery and he had made it uh, slaughtery with the the sounds and the effects and all that stuff that was there and it was only fish to say so so um yes there, there, are, are, a lot of, even, yes. there are even even stronger than those with horses and cows unfortunately yes but yes. Uh, is the is the power of story and the power of narratives that's excellent also for 
for uh, for showing people and uh, make them aware that some things are not uh, working very well in the world. Yes, exactly. And good stories as well. How, how could we create more good feedback loops? <laughs> I guess that's that's our job, <laughs> at least. That's, uh, but we... that's, that's, that's a bit more, more challenging because we are wired uh, for uh, light, freeze, or fight. We exactly. are not wired for giving love, right? So, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's the most difficult part. Yes, yes, how to um, uh, reconnect all the time, get yourself loose and reconnect. So, so maybe we could create a work life that uh, forces us to <laughs> get loose of work yes, for a like, uh, like, different way like, than nowadays. So it would be part of the work to go to reconnect. I mean, <laughs> yes, it's like the so called chaos. Or the breathing, right? So you are from divergence, convergence, divergence, convergence. Yeah. And, yes. and, and so it's expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. Yes, yes. like breathing, mm. <laughs> but more conscious level, more systemic level. <laughs> that sounds quite nice vision. Yeah, I think I think Kari said something interesting there when he was uh, saying that. Um, yeah, we we actually need many many types of systems tools to you know do this stuff in real life. So yeah, we need systems communication that Bia Bia is describing, and then we maybe need this more scientific, uh, systemic uh, system systems mapping mapping uh, for for some some reasons, and then we want to you know be able to establish systemic goals, so perhaps quantify and qualify some type of you know aspects that we're. We want to uh, want to uh, reach for, and then we need systemic funding so that we can operate the systems. We need the network, uh, you know, being able to work as networks. Um, and um, how how do we make make decisions in systemic manners? So, uh, and and how how do you know we we build relationships in systemic manners? So that these are you know many 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 separate separate fields that should come together when we are doing the actual work and i'm not quite sure if the systems uh um systems uh, practice has still uh, uh, become so established enough that we uh, appreciate that there are these many 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 different you know approaches we need to be able to do this in practice mm. well Have perhaps you... organisms start with cells right mm. so <laughs> Even if there is not an established practice, there can be powerful cells that are part of the transformation. So it, over time, it may propagate and double, make it four time, four, four times, etc., till it becomes an organism. Right. So uh, the work can be still be done with a small group and then expand. Has anybody uh, tested a uh, uh, chat GPT with system uh, thinking? Uh, how 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 does it <laughs> behave with these issues? It has many nice explanations. <laughs> okay. Some are artificial. <laughs> yeah. What I suspect is is that it may identify patterns, uh, correlational patterns in big data, but that doesn't mean causality at all. So, mm -hmm. so uh, that there might be biased conclusions even uh, that arise from those correlations that uh, many people, they believe that is evidence and there are patterns and they even try to anticipate the future with that but maybe totally flawed. So what to do, right? It's also a mindset. There's a problem that if they don't understand contexts and the ontologies and the different meanings in the different contexts, and perhaps that's something which is missing. And I believe somewhere, someday they will be closer, but it's not here yet.
Well, a thought I had recently is to, of course, not use these large language models to do any kind of analysis or prediction, but to help us, for example, in the participatory model building to, uh, and to parse all the conversation and teach out the, the assessments that are really key then, then, and then translate it into someone, something that is easier than to, to put into a model. And so that, that would make the participatory model building a lot faster than the iterations between people. That, that would be awesome. Mm. I've used it so that I many times put in chat keep it things and the structures and some way, and then it gives me something. And then I put it back and then I rethink. And for example, if you do project planning, then I talk my own thing and then put it in the words and put that back to the G chat keep GPT, which makes it better. And then I, in the quite fast way, can generate much more that I could do alone without that. So it's helpful mm. if you use it properly and look, yeah. So take the best part of that. Okay. So I have to I, say I have about to... the AI one thing, it, it, it doesn't relate to that, but I work with the creative industries now and there is a lot of things like that uh, songs and pictures and films created by AI and then there's all the legal issues, who owns them. There are even companies which there are only EIs owning them, so no people. So it makes quite a mess about our system if we don't do new rules, which is once again a systemic change issue. Okay, thanks a lot <laughs> for joining. We are heading to half past six. So if, if there is something you wish to still share, it would be very nice to hear. Otherwise, I guess we might end this discussion and uh, and uh, hope to wish to see you soon again <laughs> and then please become members and uh, follow us and and uh, share your wonderful thoughts thanks a lot for being here <laughs>